listening to the DFO Rundown Podcast with Frank Saravalli and Jason Greger on dailyfaceoff.com. Welcome to episode 35 of the DFO Rundown. We're coming to you from the woodjerseys.com studio. Take your office or fan cave to the next level and rep your favorite team with a unique piece of wall art. I'm telling you, the intricacy of these jerseys is fantastic. And by the way, they're an officially licensed NHL product. Head over to woodjerseys.com to see if they have your favorite team. They're adding more every week. And use promo code DFODAD15 for $15 off. So we've got a special guest here today on the rundown. Craig Button is filling in. I don't know. It's not even fair to say filling in. Jason Greger is on vacation. He's wrapping up a mountain adventure with his family. And we are pleased to welcome in Craig Button. You know him as a man who wears many hats at TSN. He's an analyst, opinionista, director of scouting. <laughs> and I'm fortunate to call him a good friend and mentor. Craig, thanks a lot for joining us. Yeah, my pleasure. I'll tell you what, I, I, I hope that Jason and his family are in a good place in the mountains because this is the runoff season. This is the runoff season from all the snow, right? So it can get a little, the higher you go, you can come across the elements. So, uh, you know, I think Jason uh, has a lot of experience. So I, I just hope he doesn't run into any of those elements because, you know, rain at the lower elevations turns into snow at the higher elevations. Yeah, I was going to say, so for someone that is uneducated in all of what that means. Like what, like, so what, what could he, so you're saying it could be freezing cold, the higher up you go. Like that's it just will the time be. of year. Yeah, it will be like, you, you know, if the temp and the temperatures always drop in the mountainous regions, uh, you know, that's just uh, what happens, but you know, you get rain and like, so you're down at, uh, you're down at ground level, but you're up the mountains, you're up five, six, 8,000 feet. It can turn into snow. Frank, I've hiked. I've hiked in the middle of July where it could be, you know, 85 degrees when you start out at the bottom and the higher you go and the weather changes and all of a sudden you're coming across snow. I don't know how many years ago, it was one of the funniest things I saw, but there was these German tourists and there's probably about, I don't know, maybe 12 of them. I think there were two families, maybe three families. And we got up to the top and they had, it wasn't snowing, but there was snow on the ground. And, and they were just throwing their bodies down this little slope <laughs> because they, they couldn't believe that they had all this snow uh, to enjoy in the middle of July. So it can change. And, uh, but like I said, Jason's experienced. Yeah. So speaking of things that you can't believe, I, I, don't, I didn't see this coming with the Montreal Canadiens, Craig. I think we have to start with the Habs. Um, now up 3 nothing, chance to close out the series with a sweep against the Winnipeg Jets on Monday night. And, you know, I'm wondering if, you know, just in, in general, we got this wrong. I say we as the larger hockey world watching, that maybe the Habs were a team that just needed to survive the regular season because they were built for the playoffs. Like, do you think we got this wrong or do you think that they've just found it at the right time? Well, I mean, yeah, I, I, I think you go back in time when you see a team like this uh, performing the way they have, you know, in their previous six games. Because let's keep one thing in mind. Their first four games against the Toronto Maple Leafs, they were dominated. And like the series would have been over in four games if it wasn't for Carey Price in that game one victory and a couple of blunders by the Toronto Maple Leafs. So, you know, after game four, there was, uh, there was no reason to believe Montreal – uh, had any chance to win another game, let alone three. Now we're on to six. So I, like, I, you're always looking back for signals. And Frank, you watch the game closely. What in the last two months of the regular season gave you any indication that much? Why? Because the calendar flips and it's playoff time and somebody said they're, they're built for the playoffs that we should just believe them. And then you see the evidence in the first four games. Listen, I, I, I said that I thought uh, uh, Toronto was the superior team. I thought that Montreal, there was no way they could beat them four games. In fact, I didn't even think they could beat them one. And after four games, Montreal Canadiens fans didn't think they could win another. They scored four goals in four games. But they made some, you know what the playoffs are about, making adjustments, finding a way to, uh, you know, get your get your game, you know, firing on all cylinders. Well, I would suggest right now they're firing on all cylinders. So you mentioned the adjustments, and I think you spoke eloquently about that over the last week. What specifically has really caught your eye about what the Canadians have done? Well, you know, when, when Dominic Ducharme took over, you know, he talked about attacking offensively in different ways. 
And then for whatever reason, it seems they reverted back to what they were doing under Claude Julien. You know, they were going to uh, attack uh, off the rush transition. And that was going to be about all they were going to do. And they weren't going to score a lot. They, they weren't scoring a lot. I mean, they, they'd scored two or less goals in, in, in half their games. And, you know, that's not a recipe. And then the same thing was happening against the Toronto Maple Leafs. Well, all of a sudden now, you know, you start to watch, okay, we're going we're, we're gonna to get the puck in the offensive zone. We're going to cycle the puck more. We're going to create chances off the cycle. We're going to get the puck into the slot area. And they did all of that. Then combined with that, you know, they went with the four defensemen, you know, basic, I mean, they're playing with four defensemen, Sherratt and Weber and Edmondson and Petrie and, and, and Toronto didn't do it. And in the five, six and seven, and Winnipeg hasn't done it in the first three games. You know, if you're playing against a team like that with four defensemen, you're trying to wear them down. Just keep putting the puck behind them. Keep, just make them turn and go turn and turn, keep making them turn and turn and turn and keep going back for pucks, tire them out. Well, now, neither one of those teams, they want to carry the puck. They want to possess the puck. And they keep turning the – so now not only not only do you not wear out the defensemen, now that you watch the defense, they're up at the blue line. <laughs> they're up at the red line. They're pressing forward and challenging. So now Winnipeg, you know, they're not able to generate any speed from the neutral – from their defensive zone through the neutral zone because they haven't had a game plan to take those defensemen who are really supporting the thrust of their attack – and, and they're really doing a really good job of what I call in-zone offense. So, you know, those adjustments that Dominic Ducharme, we saw them early in Dominic Ducharme's tenor, and then for whatever reason it fell off. But they have uh, – they've come back in, in a big way. And, you know, I know that you're a, a huge fan of Corey Perry. And, you know, it's, it, it's interesting to me listening to the broadcast last night. People are talking about 07 and Corey Perry. Did they not watch the Stanley Cup final last year? <laughs> he was in he was in the yeah. final last year with Dallas, right? Like why do we got to go back to 07? We know we want a cop, but you know what he did last year, he's showing that he's capable of doing again this year. A hundred percent. Now you mentioned the defenseman though. How much does that change for the Habs if Jeff Petrie has to miss tonight's game? Well, that that, that changes big time because the defenseman they're looking to put in there. If they like you, you is know, it like, Romanoff? Is that is that the guy you'd put in? Well, I'd put Romanov in. I'd have Romanov in now. I think he's better than Brett Kulak and Eric Gustafson, you, you, you know. But, you know, I don't know if they're going to push him up the lineup. When Petrie left the game in, uh, in game three, they put Kulak up there. And, you know. And, and John so, Merrill's played some games too, Yeah, right? John, exactly, right? So who are they going to – all I know is, is that it's a massive fall off. There, there's a, You know, the coaches are so good at telling you how they feel about players. <laughs> So they're, they're not saying a whole lot. Yeah. Well, no, but like, but what, what I'm saying is they're telling you exactly how they feel about John Merrill and uh, Eric Gustafson and Brett Kulak, that we're going to play four defensemen. That's what mm -hmm. they're saying. They're saying we don't have defensemen that can play many minutes after those guys. And so I think that, uh, you know, opportunity presents itself for the Winnipeg Jets, you know, in the absence of Jeff Petrie, because he, he, he's been, he's been outstanding for, for the Canadians, but you don't replace him. I mean, but this is part of the trick for coaches too with Romanov. He hasn't played since the beginning of the playoffs, right? So now you put him in there. How much, how much does he trust himself? How much do the coaches trust him? Right. I, I know Alexander, he's a confident kid and, but it's the playoffs. And you know, if there was any time to get his feet wet, it's when you're up three, nothing, not when you're down three, nothing. So I, I think it's a good opportunity to get Romanov in the lineup and play him, not put him on the end of the bench, however much you, but you're going to have to take some of the, uh, some of the minutes uh, for Petrie and, uh, and, you know, just uh, push them around the, the different players. Mm -hmm. So has Dominic Ducharme done enough in your opinion to, have you seen enough to keep him as your head coach for next season? Well, yeah, well, you know, this is part of the evaluation, right? And we, one of the things it's interesting, Frank, in, in Canada, Canada just won the world championship. Mm -hmm. And, you know, a week ago I was hearing, oh boy, this is going to really hurt Gerard Gallant's chances. Now they win the gold medal. Now Gerard Gallant should be, should be immediately coaching right in the NHL. Like, right. The evaluation of a coach should never be on short term, <laughs> ever, good or bad. And so to me, you know, Gerard Gland has shown that he's been a good coach and I'll finish with that and go on to Dominic. So Dominic has shown that he was willing, uh, when he came in, he was willing to change things. And then the team struggled. Then they were, had their backs against the wall. And I think he made some significant adjustments 
that have really helped the team. So you go through that, like, wh why, Dominic, did you, did, did, did you go back here? And, and that's a conversation that's going on all the time. But then you start to find your, your footing, so to speak. And Dominic finds his voice. I'll, I'll, t I'll share a story with you, Frank. Back in 1990-91 season, Bob Ganey, he'd retired in 89, went to France and coached and played. And then he came back to the Minnesota North Stars. Our team wasn't very good. And around the end of January, we, we were right at the bottom of the league. We were four points out of what was then the Lindros <laughs> sweepstakes, right? But Bob said that it was only towards the end of January, that part of the season, that he found his coaching voice and that he realized that the players were looking to him for direction. And our team really took right off. I mean, we played really well, obviously lost in the Stanley Cup final. I, I think a coach has to be able to find his voice too, has to find the things that he's comfortable with in, in doing so. And, and that's what Mark Bergevin uh, has to find. I've known Dominic a long time. I'll, I'll be straightforward with you. I was shocked watching the last four weeks of the season and the first four games against uh, me too against Toronto. Cause I, cause I said, I, I think Dominic knows. And, and now honestly, I was questioning myself was Dominic ready. But I've always felt that he was ready. I think he's showing now, and, and perhaps he's finding that coaching voice where he says, this is where I'm going to be assertive and where I need, need, to, need to go. Mm -hmm. But to, to go back to what you were saying, though, you, you know, coaches shouldn't be judged on the short term. But if you're looking at, you know, from when he took over till now, I'd say, you know, the recent success, you know, is obviously in his favor. But maybe by the balance, it, it might, might not be. But but why no I wouldn't but but why would that's that's what that's my yeah. opinion when you look at the, yeah. the last four weeks of the season like it was ugly but yeah but why would Mark put him in there he had to have a confidence that he could do the job just like a lot of people felt that he was ready right and that's why I say about Bob if you're going to evaluate Bob Ganey on on the success of uh, February March into the Stanley Cup final as opposed to the previous one you might say okay why would you why would you do that and that's where I think you got to find your coaching voice your coaching footing. I, I, what I would say right now is Dominic's found his coaching footing. The, the, the thing that I would be examining with Dominic, what happens when, we, when we're faced with real adversity again? I think he's handled it really well here in the playoffs with Toronto. Now they're up 3 nothing against Winnipeg. That next adversity, you know, you, you evaluate, okay, what are you going to do if Petrie's not available? That's an adjustment, right? You know, and, and you're listening to him every day, the coach manager. So, I, I think Dominic has done uh, uh, did a great job in the adjustments in the game five, six, seven, and so you know, looking at what he's what he's done and the body of work, I, I would say he merits the opportunity to remain as head coach. That's what I would say. Mm -hmm. now, I, I agree. Wouldn't have, I wouldn't have said that if they would have lost in five games to Toronto. I would have said mm -hmm. it needs further evaluation. But I, I what I've seen is the things that made me believe that he could be a good NHL head coach. Mm -hmm. So the Habs game ends last night, and then immediately after that, we get Vegas and Colorado. And man, I just—it looks like a totally—it it looks like a different sport at times. Knowing that that you know the Habs or whoever wins the Jets is going to then go face the winner of that series, does the team from the North stand a chance in round three? Well, by that time, like I mean, Montreal's won six in a row, right? And do they stand a chance? Yeah, they stand a chance because. You know, they're playing a game that's dominant against their opponent right now. Just, But if you watch the first two games of that series, you're going, okay, Colorado. So Vegas found a way to, you know, put, put a roadblock in Colorado's way, just like Colorado found a way to put a, a little bit of a roadblock in Vegas's way, maybe not to the same extent. I mean, playoffs are all about adjustments and, and, and trying to find a way, okay, how does our game match up against that team? Where are we vulnerable? Where can we take advantage? Vegas has done a phenomenal job here, really since for the last eight periods, starting with period number two in game two, because it looked like, like that. I mean, Colorado ended up winning that game, but the last eight periods, boy, have Vegas ever looked. They've looked dominant. They've looked like, a t like Colorado looks like they're in way over their heads. <laughs> In the, in but it's amazing because they were just like Vegas was willing to even throw away game one. They put Robin Leonard in there. And they're like, what team has the stones to just say, hey, you know what? We're not ready for game one. We'll get back in the series. Well, well I mean, some, but it's, sometimes you just have to come to that realization, right? And I, again, back to coaching. So Peter Bohr looks at it. He knows his team. He sits back and talks about it. He goes, okay, 
we, we know that this is going to be a really hard game for us to be competitive in. And so let's just make sure that we get ourselves ready to play, understand what the opponent is doing. If we win, great. We're not, I, I know we use the term throw it away, but you know, there's also a planning that goes into it, right? Like, you know, it's a, you're trying to win four games. I, again, you, the playoffs, I call it match play. One game doesn't bleed into the second game, into the third game. And, you know, it, it's like golf. Like, just because you're, you're not good on the first hole in match play doesn't mean you can't be good on the second hole. Just because you blew up off the, off the, uh, off the tee doesn't mean you do that on the, on the next one, right? And I think the NHL playoffs are, are exactly like that. And I think that, you know, you come up, you're probably Peter Boer's looking, oh, that's a severe win. I'm not going to take out my driver. I'm going to take out my two iron, right? And, you know, I'm going to play it safe here. And, you know, if somehow I get a break and, and, and the other team on the other side takes this lightly, maybe I can ramp it up. But I think it is, uh, it does take courage. Don't make, I totally agree with you, but that Vegas team right now, and, and I wasn't so sure watching them against Minnesota and then early on against Vegas. Now I'm going, or against Colorado, excuse me. Now you're going, they're looking, I right now think Vegas is looking as good as they did on route to the Stanley Cup final mm -hmm. in 2018. Yeah, totally agree. But there seems to be a narrative coming from Colorado that this abs team has now been pretty good for the last number of years, lacks a killer instinct. I don't know how that's possibly the case when you look at Nathan McKinnon. What is it? 67 points in 47 playoff games. Like not a killer, really? Well, I, you know, when teams lose and, you know, what I would say is, is last year they lost in the second round of the playoffs in overtime with their third goalie. I think, I think they have a killer instinct, but when you're up against a team like the Vegas gold Knights who, who are playing with a real ferocity. And, and when I say ferocity, I'm not talking about physical play. They're skating and checking. And the, quite frankly, uh, Colorado right now has to find a way to make adjustments because what, what Vegas has been able to do for the last eight periods is take Colorado speed and negate it. Like, and, and if they do get skating, it's one against three or one against two. They, they, they just have no, they have no footing in the speed game. And, and that's where their game has been rooted. Now, how you find that is, is going to be a, a significant adjustment going into game five, because I think Vegas is coming into Colorado with the idea that like, we keep playing like this, we'll wrap it up in game six back home in front of uh front, front of the great fans at the fortress. Mm -hmm. So, I want to I want to get you since it's so hard to you know these teams haven't played each other outside of their division. You're watching every playoff game, Craig. I want you to rank for me the divisions in terms of how you believe the quality of play has been top to bottom. Would you, would you start with the West over the course of the year? Oh, include yeah, and including the playoffs, what you've seen. Uh, I, I would go like I mean, so, so when I look at uh, so so why don't we just start with the. Uh, uh, you know, Tampa, Carolina, and Florida in that division were all really good teams, mm -hmm. like really good teams. I mean, we saw a fantastic series with Florida and Tampa Bay, the Carolina, Tampa Bay. So, so those are, that's a trio of teams that's really good. The Pittsburgh, Washington, Islanders, Boston division, and, and the Rangers found some footing in their game, you know, down the stretch. It was good. I don't know how high end it is. I mm -hmm. like. I wouldn't put. I wouldn't put any of those teams in the category of Tampa Bay, or Carolina for that matter. Right. Right. Then, then if we go to the West and we look at Vegas and we look at Colorado, and you know St. Louis was so ravaged by injuries and and a lot of different things. And Minnesota I, was damn good. And, and then you got Minnesota that I would put in the same category as Florida. They were hard. They were the they, 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 two teams that have, you know, been in the league that really haven't had much, if any, much, if any success at all. Like I'm talking about like where they can hang their hat on. It's not about, you know, hey, yeah, we've had regular season success. But I, I put Minnesota and Florida in the same boat as teams that were hard. So you got Colorado, you got Vegas, you got Tampa Bay, you got Carolina, and then you go to the north. Right. And the north, you know, when you start to look at it, Every team had had gaps, had things. And I, I, you asked me earlier, did we did we underestimate Montreal? I'll tell you, I overestimated Toronto. Uh, I, I did. I thought they, you know, I kept looking and saying, oh, they got depth now. 
Yeah, they had depth. They didn't have quality depth. And what I mean by quality depth, they didn't have that quality depth that can turn a game in some way, scoring a goal. Like you look at the Goudreau, Coleman, Goudreau, the, the Coleman, Goudreau, Gord line, right? They can turn a game. They can turn a game in a big, big way for you. You look at, you know, the way that uh, Carolina goes deep in the lineup with speed, right? Like, I mean, then Florida had speed and you look at Vegas, you look at Colorado, like, and I thought Toronto, I did. I said, Oh, Toronto's a serious Stanley cup contender. No, <laughs> I, I overestimated Toronto. I really did. So, you know, and people kept saying during the course of the year, rightfully so that the North is, is, has got a false sense of, of, a, of, of security. I, I think that, Right now, when we saw Montreal early in the season, Frank, and now we see them now, I think that's the team that we saw for three weeks at the beginning of the season that we're seeing again now. And I think they're, well, I mean, they're going to emerge as a team coming from the north and really what looks like a team that can compete. Can they win? You can't rule anybody out, but I would say they, they'll be able to compete with these teams because of the strengths that they have, you know, deeper into the lineup. So as they square off in round three, given what you know now, how, how would you order it? Division-wise? Yes. Uh, I would divide. Well, so what was Florida's division? Was that the, that was the central? Central. Okay. So I, I, I would go, it, it'd be a toss up between central and west. North would be fourth. Okay. And the northeast would be third. Okay. Like the, it, because I, I just don't see the northeast with the high end quality. Like, mm -hmm. you know, like the Tampa and Carolina and the Vegas and the Colorado. I just don't see it. I, I see Florida and Minnesota being really competitive with those four teams that got in the playoffs. Mm -hmm. you know, hard, good teams that play that could give you a lot of challenge. And one of those teams from the Northeast is going to come through there. But clearly, maybe the Islanders. We continue. Everyone, speaking of <laughs> underestimate, I, I've been saying this for weeks. If you've been listening to the pod, you know this. Underestimate. Barry Trotz and the Islanders at your own peril. Oh, I say it all the time. And, you know, there's, there's no other way to do it. I mean, you look at what Barry Trotz continues to do year in, year out. And I go all the way back. Like, I mean, like all he does is get his, get his team. His teams find ways to, to be successful. And that starts right with the, what he instills in that group. And, you know, Frank, you watch all, you watch all the teams. And like I, I said this the other day and people were poking fun at me and that's Okay. But I talked about Adam Pellick and uh, Ryan Pulak. And I said, you watch those, that pair of defense play. And if you don't know how good they are and how hard they are and how instrumental they are, then you don't know. And people are, oh, Adam Pellick. I go, yeah, you're, you're, when, you, when you answer me with that question, you just don't know. You just don't know yeah. how good these guys are. Look at Devon Taves. He goes to Colorado and everyone says, whoa, where'd this guy come from? You're like, well, he's been playing <laughs> on the island for the last number of years. Where have yeah. you been? Exactly, right? And so, but but when you, but, but people, they're not they're not a sexy name. You know Neil Pionk. I remember when Neil Pionk got traded to the New York Rangers, the, the Winnipeg Jets fans were, oh, I can't believe that we got the Pionk. Who's this Pionk? And like, you're trying to tell them, like, he's a pretty good player. But I guess if people haven't seen them or watched them, you can't be any good, Frank. No, and that's that's but that's the Islanders. That's their yeah. like they're criminally underrated. So actually, speaking yeah. of that, a team that you could buy low and sell high on. Let me tell you about Jock Market, JockMKT.com. You've heard us talk about it before. It's a hybrid between fantasy sports gambling and the stock market. You trade shares of players in real time with other users, and at the end of the night. All shares are paid out based on fantasy point ranking. So you can get a player pretty low. He has a great night and you get paid out with a high number at the end of the night. Use promo code DFO50 to get a $50 deposit bonus. That's jockmkt.com. I got to ask you, Craig, to transition. You mentioned the worlds and Gerard Gallant and his stock rising. Be We'd be remiss to have you on and not talk about some other stocks rising coming out of the worlds. Do you think Owen Power did enough to solidify the number one overall spot in the NHL draft coming up in July? Yeah, back in February. Okay. <laughs> like, I mean, look, he's been that he's been there since September. You know, well, when you look I mean, at the rankings and Frank, you watch him play, and uh, you watch all the qualities and attributes that he possesses. There's no way. So, like. Like, if you're looking for a stamp of approval, well, I mean, he goes and competes at that level and does it exceedingly well. But, I mean, it, it, you know, for me, a lot of times, 
when I'm watching players, I, I try to say, okay, who's better than that player? And, and I do that over the course of time. And then you try to jockey with, with guys. There's always going to be people say, well, would you consider anybody else? Well, would I? No. Sh should you go through the exercise of what other players could offer? Yes. But he's the best player. And, you know, and, and again, we go back to the coaches, right? Our, the coaches are amazing. They'll, they tell you so much information by just watching the game. All you got to know is, is it drug land said, we're playing this guy. <laughs> 20, 20 minutes and 17 <laughs> seconds a night, the whole tournament. But, there you go. But I mean, he, he, he really is. He really is a, a terrific top end player. He, he is. And where do you find those players? You just don't find them. You find them at the top end of the draft. You watch Victor Hedman control the game. That's what Owen Powers potential is. So that's his direct comparable as Victor. Hedman, well, I, well I, 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 I use comparable type. I mean, Victor Hedman's the best defenseman in national hockey. League. He, like that doesn't mean he's going to win the Norris trophy this year. Or he's going to win that, but he's the best defenseman in national hockey League, in my view. And so he, uh, Owen has just got that. He, like I've compared his mind to Chris Pronger. They control the game, you know, uh, Victor Hedman, they control the game. The, 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 they're never in a situation where there's a problem for them. And, and all they're doing is creating advantages for them. So when I, when I, it's more about a comparable type of player, mm -hmm. you know, rather than that type of player, because, you know, to say, you, you know, when I watch Owen Power, I, I see a lot of the way Nick Lidstrom played too. You know, the way they think, the way that you think you have them in some kind of vulnerable spot, guess what? They're not in a vulnerable spot. They know it, and then they, they also know how to how, how to uh, get themselves in, in, into a spot where you know they can you know take advantage of, of your thinking, right? Like, I mean, oh, it's just it, it, it's really special to watch those high end players with that type of uh, hockey uh, acumen. So, how you know if you're looking at sizing up this draft after Owen Power at number one, where do you go? Like, how deep you know? One of the things that you, know, like you and I, we talked about so many years working together at TSN is trying to group players properly. Where does the first group of players end? Is it at pick five? Is it at pick seven? How do you slot these groups of players out in this draft? Yeah, I, I, would, I, I think there's a lot of good defensemen like the, after Brant Clark, Simon Edmondson, you know, Luke Hughes, I think come into that category. I think... Matty Beniers, you know, who, who played for the USA at the World Championships as well, was part of the USA gold medal winning world junior team, uh, a teammate of Owen Power at Michigan. You, you know, William Eklund is a really good player at, uh, in, in Sweden this year. Dylan Gunther, I, I think that that's the seven. I, I'd even put Wallstead in there, the goaltender. I really would. And I, I think it's at that point in time that I would say I've, at those eight guys are – are, are, are somewhat in a group. That's my, where, where I see it. And then there's a next group, probably Frank of, I don't know, eight to 12 other players. Now that you, you, you can start to move around and start to consider depending on the type of player they are, what you're looking for, what you like, because a lot of it comes down to just, Hey, I like that player. And doesn't mean that, you know, that he's better than the right winger or you, you just like that player and you take him and you celebrate it. And, so that's where I would see it in, in this year's draft. And, you know, I, I, I think in that, after that eight, then whether it's seven or nine, then that's where there's a lot of room for disparity. Do you want a goaltender? Well, there's, there's, there's Sebastian Costa is a really good goaltender. So does somebody want to step up and take a goaltender somewhere at 15 or 13 or whatever? Uh, I don't think there's as many defensemen, you know, as you go deeper into the draft, as you go past those first four. You know, there's just, it seems to be at, at that point in time, it, it becomes forwards. And if you want a goalie, you take a goalie to, to 20, you know, and, and, and that's where I, that, that's where I see it unfolding. And then there's quality in the draft. There's depth in the draft and, you know, but it's going to take a few years for that, uh, for that to show up. Mm -hmm. So you're saying we could see multiple goalies selected in the first round this year. Yeah. I'll be shocked if there isn't multiple goalies selected in the first round. When's the last yeah. time that happened? Uh, Malcolm Subban and Andre Vasilevsky. Was that 2011? 12. 12. Okay. Yeah. So Vasilevsky went 19 and I think Subban went 25. To and Boston. Spencer Knight was what? 13? 13. Two years ago? Two years ago. And Askarov was 11. 
uh, last year for Nashville. So you're saying we could see one inside the top 10. Yeah. You said Wallstead. Yeah. He's wow. a, you know, and well, you know, I was asked this question, Frank, about Wallstead, all oh, taking a chance on a goaltender. I said, well, you know, why? And they said, well, it takes time. I said, well, what happens if I told the Wallstead's as close to playing in the NHL as any forward or defense room you might consider at that point? Does that not change the equation? <laughs> you see Spencer Knight come in two years later and make his impact in the playoffs. I mean, it's only the most important position on your <laughs> roster. I mean, like, is it really that much of a risk? Well, I, but, but if you want to say, okay, it's going to take him four years, I, like you can say, you know, we don't want to do that. But Wallstadt's played in the SHL and Lulia and been a really good goaltender. He's closer to playing than not playing. And, and, and as I said, you're right. You look at Spencer Knight and you look at goaltenders and you look at, uh, you know, players that you would say, okay, we're going to take a defenseman. You can't tell me taking an 18 year old defenseman, he's, he's going to be more ready to play. I'm talking about, you know, after those first four defensemen are gone, even those first four Simon Edmondson, isn't going to be ready to play for two years. And I don't think Brad Clark's going to be ready to play for two years. And I don't think Luke Hughes is going to be ready to play for two years. I think Wallstead will be ready to play in two years, just like those guys. So mm-hmm. what's the problem to your point? Does Luke Hughes last until Vancouver picks? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. I, I think the interesting one is this at four. Uh, the you Devils? Know, Devils. And, you know, the, but I also think there's another brother of a Devils prospect, a player that, that, that could go ahead of Luke Hughes, and that's Brant Clark. His brother Graham is in the Devils organization. And I, I really like Luke Hughes. If it was my choice, I would take Brant Clark. I think Brant Clark's got a, got a quality of uh, the way NHL defensemen play with the puck in the offensive zone. He, he's bold. He, he's, he's got this blend of Klingberg, Brent Burns, Eric Carlson style game. And I want that on my blue line. I want yeah. that on my blue line, Frank. <laughs> That's a heck of a hybrid. I mean, I can't even, yeah, I'm trying to like piece together as you're saying it, what that looks like. And I just keep seeing the zoo animals from Brent Burns' farm. <laughs> Well, maybe Brad will go do that. Maybe he'll take a visit out there. But I, I really believe Brad, he just has that game. He has that ability to do so many different things in, in the game that just can impact it. And he's never a player that's thinking, you know, when I watch Kucherov play, I always say Kucherov, he never predetermines anything. He never predetermines. So how do you defend him? Because he, it's like a blank canvas. That's how Brad Clark plays. That's how Eric Carlson plays, right? Like that's Klingberg, you know, his ability to, to just play the game and, and do it. And then, of course, Brent, Brent Burns says, this is who I am. This is who I'm going I'm to play like. You have to, ex- you have to just let a player like Brent Clark be who he is. And if you let him be who he is, I think you, you got a chance to get a brilliant player there. Mm-hmm. I, I just, I, you know, I, I don't proclaim to be a draft expert. You've, you're that guy. You, you do it so well. I don't even need to dabble in that area. But I got to tell you, just watching Matty Beniers, I, whoever gets him, I think is getting a really special player. Yeah, I, I totally agree with you. And I think that he, you know, watching Matty over the years, you, you know, you watch his ability to not only wh- wherever he plays. He, he, he digs he, in. Yeah. And, and, and he makes everybody around him better. He makes teams better. <laughs> like, is that what, you know, I, I, I've compared him in type to Bo Horvat, who's the captain of the, of the and, and I've had some people say, you know, NHL personnel say he, he's got some of the same qualities Jonathan Tays had or has. I don't want to talk about Jonathan in the past tense, despite him not playing this past year. But, you know, when you hear people that the people that I certainly respect make, make that comp, they're not saying he's Jonathan Tays, but qualities like Jonathan Tays that makes you sit up and take real notice. And I, I, I think Maddie Beniers is, is going real early, <laughs> like real early in the draft uh, in, in for, for an NHL team. In fact, I'm not so sure he lasts past two. Oh, I was going to say, he's going to be right up there. Now, do, you, <laughs> do you, what'd you make of his world championship? Well, I mean, he's a younger player trying to go into a, a situation like, he was fine. I thought he was fine. And, you know, again, it, it's body of work. He handled the challenges and, you know, he showed that he, he, he can fit there. Right. But like, you know, you're also, it's new for him. It's a new style of game. The players are more experienced. The players are older. They, you know, the, they're a little bit more patient. Like when you're a younger player, you can take advantage of other players that aren't as skilled as you and that aren't as experienced and aren't as patient as you, but you go up to that level of pro hockey, 
first of all, they're not as skilled as you because you wouldn't be, we wouldn't be talking about, but what they are are smart and they got lots of experience to say, we're not going to let you beat me this way. So for a young player to go in there and acquit himself in the way that Maddie did, I thought it was really good. I think the best news for Maddie was when he had that uh, injury where it didn't look good. It, it looked terrific actually. And to see him come back and be able to skate and play, I think that was that takes a lot of worry out, right? Well, and and I saw it with Peyton Krebs. I mean, Peyton Krebs had a had a really unusual injury, you know, training like uh, like with a skate cut on the Achilles, and I think it it impacted the 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 thoughts around him from NHL teams, and you just don't want that with any young player. You just want them to be able to go into the draft clean, no, no, no questions out of their control. The teams are asking. I think that's great news for Maddie. You know, I, I got to ask you, thinking back to the draft a number of years ago, I think it was 2015. It would have been my first draft working at TSN. And we're in Florida, and I'm now watching him tear it up against the Bruins, Matthew Barzell, and the Bruins have three picks in a row, and they don't grab him. I'm still, you know, all these years later, still trying to understand why Barzell waited until that spot. Why did, why did he hang around on the board so long? And I went to Seattle. I spent an hour with him before, you know, a couple months before the draft, the flyers were picking at seven. I was covering the flyers that previous season. And I was saying, this is a special kid, a special talent. And he goes all the way that far down the board. What happened? How does that happen? Yeah, I think it's always a good question. I think there's a, the, you know, everybody's going to rationalize it and, and try to explain why. So I'll go number one with Boston. Don Sweeney had just taken over as GM and he would maneuver trading some players. And ultimately, I think he was trying to get higher in the draft. And and one of the things you always have to- To get clear, Hannafin, right? Well, is that is, if that was the play. I think that was the target. Yeah. yeah. So, well, which would have been a mistake too. Because if you're trying to get Noah Hannafin ahead of Zach Wierenski or Ivan Provorov, <laughs> right? So the, the, that thinking wasn't right either. <laughs> like trying right. to get higher. And, I, and listen, I'm not here to say you're trying to pinpoint a player and, and, and whatnot and trying to say, okay, this is where we want to go. So, so you know, you, you're sitting there. And one of the things you have to, I think, in, in, in a draft is, is you, you always have to be careful with falling in love with your list teams fall in love with their list your list is right teams trade up how many times frank you've covered drafts how many times you hear oh they're trying to trade up you know why they're trying to trade up because they have somebody on their list that they've ranked high <laughs> and so you know i know i know at times you gotta just say maybe we haven't ranked too high <laughs> maybe we shouldn't be so uh you know confident I, I, in I, yeah well, in how we're viewing this. you need confidence but you also need realization i remember one year in calgary uh, our group, they, they, they wanted a player, wanted a player and they, they, they had them rated high. And I, I mean, that was their job. And they kept saying to me, you know, we, we got to trade up, we got to trade up. And I'm like, I'll be straightforward with you in all honesty. I, I, I faked it. <laughs> I said, that player will be there when, when we go to pick in the second round. And he was, <laughs> who was it? Do you remember? Uh, I do. I don't, it, it, I, it was Curtis Foster. Okay. Yeah. It was Curtis Foster. And, uh, but like, you know, like I'm looking at it but, and I'm looking, I go, I, he'll be there. He'll be there. Like, I'm not going to start trading, but everybody, oh my God. And, and like, this wasn't one time or two times. It was five times. We got to get him. We got to get him. And I'm just going, yeah, well, I'll sit back and wait <laughs> because I, I, I didn't feel it was worth trading up to go. Like, I just felt based on looking at the draft that he would be there at the pet, but, but that's what, but you have to listen. How do you manage that as a manager? Because, you know, your guys have done the work all year and you're trying to appease them a bit, but you've also, you know, maybe have seen them, but in more limited viewings as a manager. Well, uh, yeah, you're right. Uh, but, but what you have to do is, is it's not a science. You're trying to understand the draft. What, what ma managers are trying to always try to understand where players may fall in a draft, right? So you're taking in information, from, from, from different teams and finding out who, who's interested in who and what they're trying to do. Because you're getting those calls. Would you consider trading up, right? And would you consider trading back? And so you're leading into the draft, so you're getting a pretty good sense uh, of where players are going to fall into a range. It's not like saying, oh, you, you, you think it, you, uh, he'll be there, 
but doesn't mean he will be. It just means that you're making that assessment based on the information you have. You're not, you're not dismissing the scouts. You're, you're not doing that at all. You're just, you're just trying to understand, you know, where you can maximize different points of the draft. That, that, that there's no certainty to it, but that's what you're trying to do. So, you know, when I, when, when, so back to Barzell, right? Like you go back to Barzell. So I think that, you know, number one, Don was a new GM. Don Sweeney was a new GM. He'd been with the Boston Bruins. So you don't know what they're at. But Matt Barzell, he, first of all, he'd had a he'd had an injury. He'd had a knee injury. So we talk about injuries to players. And so that played that played into some of his performance, you know, in terms of where he was playing, right? But Matthew also was a player that uh, you know, he, he had to develop and, and, and understand some areas of his game. And I think he still is. I mean, in the early part of these playoffs, you know, before, before he's really emerged because he's got the talent, you know, you know Barry Trotz knew he needed a lot more out of Matt Barzell. And mm-hmm. we, we, I think we tend to forget at times he's 24 years of age and, you know, we're dealing with young players. So I think it was a case of, you know, just, you know, his game wasn't, and this is where projection comes in. His game wasn't, you know, at, at the same level that we see it now, or even just shortly thereafter, you know, and, and, and the injury didn't help him. It didn't help him. And, you know, even with the Boston Bruins, I joke about, you know, they were in the right city watching St. John Sea Dogs. Shabbat and Zaboro were both playing on that team. They, they made their assessment on Zaboro that he was better. And that's a mistake. And there's no question about it. And, you know, those are going to happen. But I think Barzell was a case of, you know, like the injury and, you know, probably a little bit of inconsistencies in his game. I forget what he scored in his draft year, Frank. I think he had something like 15 goals or something. And that part of that was injury. But, hey, the Islanders, there's a lot of teams that uh, went past uh, Matty Barzell, not just the Bruins, that, you know, the, the Edmonton Oilers went past them. And, you know, but – you know, Shabbat went in that draft and Kyle Connor went in that draft. And you can't, Kessler you can't mention draft. the Oilers. The Oiler fans are still having nightmares about Griffin Reinhardt from that draft. That was well, the trade that went down. But they also traded the uh, second round pick too. And, you know, like, you know, Kyle Connor, you know, there was an irony when Kyle Connor scored the overtime winner in a series clincher in game four, he, he, he got picked after that 16th pick too. How would he look on, how would he look on the left wing with uh, uh, Connor McDavid? There's, uh, you know, if you were trying to rank the Peter Shirelli mistakes, I'm not even sure where the Griffin Reinhardt one comes in. You've got the Strom and Spooner mistake and, oh, uh, you got the Koskinen contract 48 hours before he was, it's like, if you could have a field day trying to put those in order. Well, you could. And, 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 and the other thing too, and like, I, I'm like, I'm not going to do revisionist history, but, but I felt that the orders that year at 16, that. Like if you're if you're gonna take a goalie, that was the year to take Samsonov, uh, Ilya Samsonov. He he was the best goalie in the draft in my view. He's performed. He went twenty something, right? If, yeah, he Washington. went to Washington, right? And 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 the timing for Washington really worked out well. Holtby was still good, right? And then, and they, they put that and they put him into the in, in you know into the pipeline. Let him let him grow, and now here he is in the NHL performing quite well. And I think he'll continue to raise the level of his game, but. You know, it's you win the lottery, you get McDavid. Like, just draft a goaltender and 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 go. But that's all since, you need. It's like a ready-made Stanley Cup starter kit, <laughs> McDavid and a goalie. Okay. But even if you don't do it, you could go like and just looking back at the draft, you you can look at a goalie, you can look at Shabbat, you can look at Besser, you can look at Connor. Right? Those are just those are just some guys. So you have a right winger, a left winger. You have a center in Barcel, a defenseman in Shabbat, and you could have a goalie in, in oh. Sansano. <laughs> like, it's enough. If it's enough, if you're an Oilers fan, to make you nauseous. It, it is because you know. And then you I, see Griffin Reinhardt. Really, like he didn't have the foot speed then to play in the league, and he was never going to have it as the league's getting faster and faster. And, and that's the key, right? Is projecting not only how how much a player's skating can improve if you got concerns about it, but also how how fast the league is getting faster. But sometimes, and, and you and me have talked about this, Frank, about with Samuel Moran. And, and I liked, I thought that he was a prospect that had, that had potential and he worked his, he worked hard on his skating. 
the problem for Sam is, is that as he worked on his skating, the league was at what speed of the league was, was increasing at a greater rate than he could improve his skating. It wasn't. And so you got, you got to factor that all in, right? Like, you know, you, you, if you cannot skate at the NHL level, and as the league becomes increasingly faster, doesn't matter how hard you work at your skating. You, you've got to be right in your projections on skating because mm -hmm. it's unforgiving and, and it's obvious, right? Like you, you see a player that can't hold in there. You, tough I mean, you would think it's obvious, but maybe not. I'm, I'm saying it obvious at the NHL level, if you can't right. skate, like and you, guys get put in there and go, Oh boy, <laughs> that's going to be a problem. Mm -hmm. So I want to ask you about, the Los Angeles Kings, they're a team I've got circled on my list, Craig, as a serious impact team this offseason. I think they're going to be right in the mix on so many different things. They have seven guys on your top 75 affiliated prospects list. Are they far and away the deepest pipeline? I, I would say right now they are, and that's going to come when you draft Quentin Byfield second and you draft Alex Turcotte fifth, right? You have you have other first round draft picks. You you have some really good players you drafted after the first round. You know, I like like they are like they, they're in a great position. They're they're in a great position, Frank, as you know, to not only consider different opportunities, you know, because they have cap flexibility, but they also have prospects that they can, you know, meet the, meet the demands of other teams and good prospects and prospects that are probably closer to playing than not playing. I mean, you know, you look at, like, look at where Gabe Velarde has found himself, right? Like Gabe Velarde that, after some injury struggles, Jared Anderson Dolan, like, you know, he's Both those guys have a nice world championship Yeah, and they did, didn't they? Right. Like, you know, without, you know, Sean Walker, who was a free agent, another nice world championship, right? Like, you know, yeah, you, you look at those players, you know, uh, and, and their ability. And, and then you look at the high end players, right? Like, I mean, I mean, that team, I, I'm a big believer that when you're trying to build your team, we can look at the, the, the elements that are necessary. Yeah, you need a good goaltender, you need prospects, you, you got a man. But you look at where the LA Kings find themselves. Like, you got to sink it all up. The young players got to be ready to contribute. You know, the older players have to still be able to contribute. I'm not talking about 35. I'm talking about older players like we're Kopitar. They got to be able to contribute and play, but they need help. And the younger right. players need help and you, and you need depth down your lineup. So you can't, you, you, your cap has to be in order. So syncing that all up is such a big key in terms of having success. I think the LA Kings are in that spot. You know, when you start to look at where they're at, like look at the years of Kopitar. Kopitar had a fantastic year. Drew Doughty had a real strong year. Big bounce back year. Yeah. yeah. Jonathan Quick had a, had, a, had a good year. They got Cal Peterson in the net, who was named the goalie at the, the goalie of the tournament for the, at the World Championships. I talked about uh, uh, Sean Walker, but you got Byfield, you got Turcotte, you got Kaliev, you got Kupari, you got Jared Anderson, Dolan. Like, I mean, like they're ready made. Dustin Brown had a great year. They're, they're ready to, to explore lots of opportunities. And what I will say to that too, Frank, when you got two players that are making the money that quick, not quick, excuse me, Doughty and Kopitar are making, well, you're going to need some performing players. On entry level, yeah. And, and even in that mid-range coming out yep. of entry level that aren't eating up, I think the LA Kings have found themselves in, in a phenomenal position to, to, to explore. Well, that's <laughs> what I was going to say. You might, I'm looking at it from a trade perspective. You yeah. may not need to. You may be able to shuffle those guys in, as you mentioned, and and have them, you know, slot in with the other guys that they have, that they can be in that spot to compete without even really making significant trades. Well, and and, and why don't we play a little hypothetical here? Okay. So you know, I like that. <laughs> so Jack Eichel is he going to be traded? Is he not going to be traded? I mean, the two biggest names in the, in, in the marketplace to be traded in the respective sports are Jack Eichel and Aaron Rodgers. Right for for different reasons, but you know when you on look a slightly at that, different scale too. Like yeah, no, I know, I know, but I'm just yeah. saying. But those are the, everybody see. I mean, we saw Julio Jones get traded for a second round draft pick. Like think mm -hmm. about that, a 2022 second round draft pick. This top before football is different, but so now if you're considering trading for Jack Eichel, so some people will say, well, geez, uh, that's hard. You're gonna you're gonna commit 31 million dollars, 31.5 million dollars to three players. Right. And that's what you would do. But you might be able to consider it in L.A.'s case 
because of these other players on entry level contracts, these other players that are younger moving out, like Alex Ayafalo, that's a good contract. I mean, you got him for four years. You got certainty in that area. You're going to have contracts coming off the books as some of these entry level players are, you know, moving into their second contract. Right. So, you know, you, I don't think, I don't think you can just dismiss it out of hand that Jack Eichel, you know, playing in, in LA, you know, could be feasible what because of yeah. Like, I think it could be. Now, there's other places where no, it's not going to be a fit because they don't have they don't have the younger players and they don't have the cap room. They're just going to stress themselves out that are going to prevent them from having the depth. I think the LA Kings are positioned themselves exceptionally well. They're the team I keep mentioning in the Jack Eichel sweepstakes. Yeah. Like, look, I, I'd be surprised at this point if Jack Eichel remains a saber into October, but I'd actually like you to you know put yourself in Kevin Adams' shoes, not asking you to predict what he will do, but if you were in that situation, you know, would the would you be trying everything you can to try and you know mend this bridge and 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 fix it and and keep him? Because I just don't see a way in which moving Jack Eichel makes your team any better in the short term or long term. I think it's a trade you lose every time. Yeah, and 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 I think that I think Kevin has to know that, and I, I think he does know that, right? So, I think the first thing is 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 you're trying to uh, you know impress upon Jack that we are on the right track. So, you know, it, it, it's a hard it's a hard sell though. Because How do you do it? Because you've been you know not you but your predecessors have been preaching that for a long time. Well, they have. So here, here's what I would say, Frank. Honestly, and and like like I think based on what happened under Donnie Granato and, and the way that that team played under Donnie Granato, the way he engaged with his players, the way he said, like, to me, I think the first thing begins with instilling, installing Don Granato as your permanent head coach. That's what I think. I think what he demonstrated with his group of players, it, it was significant. And, and, and with the, with the way they played, I mean, they, they became a team, they, they became a team that was quite frankly, a disaster under Ralph Kruger. It was a disaster. It, like you, you, and you know, and, and a team that knew they had no, they had no spirit, they had no esprit de corps, none. And Don not only instilled a really good game plan, a really good uh, uh, opportunity for the players to excel, but you could see the players now had 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 an esprit de corps and a spirit. Well, so you're going to start over with new coach again, who's going to come in from outside that doesn't know. I, I think that Kevin Adams personally will have a bigger challenge if he doesn't name Don Granado coach with other players are going to say, get me out of here. Yeah. That's what I, that's where I think Kevin. Now, you know what? Does Kevin recognize that? I don't know. You'd have to ask. And Kevin what's he that. waiting for? Like, I mean, you're now a, a month into this process. Well, I think that that is a, a fair question, a legitimate question. Right. And, 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 you know, again, the Buffalo Sabres have been magnificent at winning press conferences. <laughs> The, like magnificent like like if you look at how they win press conferences like they they should hang banners for for winning press conferences but you know I, i'm with you like it's like no like and, and if and if the mending process with jack eichel is necessary to keep jack eichel then you know what get the first part done because well, i think this will extend so i don't know frank why they've waited they want to go and it say they're interviewing everybody and interviewing this person. Now I believe they have the guy right there. They had him and they, but they knew they had him six weeks ago. Yep. You I know, agree. Don Granato is one of the best stories in the NHL this season. And now you're going through this process. You're interviewing every Tom, Dick and Harry that's out there, you know, bringing in guys from Europe and not to knock any coach that's on the market. But now essentially, if you come back to Don Granato, it's like, well, we, we went through this process and there were, you know, it almost looks like they didn't get the guy that they wanted and they're settling for Don Granato instead of just making a statement five or seven days into the off season. This is our guy. This is where we're heading. It's now lingered. It has, it has. And, and, and but, but the other thing that's lingered is the Jack Eichel situation has lingered and the best opportunity, the best opportunity to trade players is coming up. Your, your best window for trading players and trying to get his teams now have players uh, coming off their, their, their salary books. And now they're going to have a little bit more room. They also have the, uh, the immediate sting of, of disappointment, wherever that may be 
losing in the first round of the playoffs, not making the playoffs, looking to change some things in your market. So now you have lots of teams involved. So, you know, now you, you, it's great. You can put, you, you, you can put a stake in the ground and say, we're not trading Jack Eichel, but like Jack Eichel, you know, it's never going to be a good situation when a player and the player has control here is going to say, like, get me out of here. Get me out. Like we, Joe Neuendijk in Calgary, we ended up getting him in 1995. And people say the players do, do not ever, ever underestimate the resolve of, of an athlete and a pro athlete. And Joe Neuendijk had reached a point where he said, I'm not playing there. I'm not playing there. I'm done. He'd won a Stanley Cup. He had everything. Like, that's Joe Neuendijk. Do not underestimate the resolve of Jack Eichel to say, I'm not playing there. <laughs> I I wouldn't underestimate. I, I couldn't blame no, him I, at this point to say, you know, what, what's going to change. He's been there for a long time. He's been, for, what is it? Four head coaches. This next one would be the fifth. I mean, what more do you need to see? Well, and that's exactly it. And, and what, and what Jack needs to see is signs. And I mean, he's talking to all his teammates. He's, he's, he, even though he didn't play, he's all, the, the, he knows Donnie. He knows Donnie for the national team development program. He coached him for three months. Yeah. <laughs> he yeah. knows. He knows them. They're all around there all the time. And so he's listening to Sam Reinhardt and Rasmus Dahlin and Ristol Linen. And he's listening to all those guys, his friends, his teammates talk about, oh, you can't believe how great Donnie was. Same thing you're hearing, same thing I hear. Mm -hmm. And the same thing that Kevin Adams should be hearing. <laughs> I, frankly, you know, I'm surprised, you know, we, we talked about Granado. I'm surprised that there hasn't been more activity on the coaching market. It's almost like these teams – They've interviewed everyone that's out there, you know, Arizona, Columbus, the Rangers, Seattle, they're waiting for, so what are they waiting for someone in the second round to get fired? And then they're well, going to make their decision. Like, I, I don't see any of the guys that are left coaching these teams getting fired. Well, how about somebody waiting for Don Granato? I'm just, what, I just what, asked like, what question. would you be waiting for? Was he not a free agent? I, I don't, I, I do not know his contractual status. Yeah. Like, I don't, I, I don't know what his contract I can't imagine but, they would stand in his way if another team were to pop up and say, we'd like to hire you. Like, yeah, I, 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 I'm just saying, I'm just, uh, again, hypothetical, right? Is somebody waiting for, uh, and, and the other thing they could be waiting for is an assistant coach or potentially an assistant coach. That's it's possible. Called, like, that's all. But again, you know, like one of the things that I feel, Frank, and, and you know this, uh, being, a, being uh, invested in, you know, knowing the teams, is that you know what you're getting with Gerard Gallant. You know what you're getting with Bruce Boudreaux. You know what you're getting with Mike Babcock. You know, so, you know, are you looking for other things? Like, and I, I understand that, like, you know, you're going to interview some European coaches. You're going to interview some college coaches, even some junior coaches. You might want to get a feel. But, like, as Ken Hitchcock told me many years ago, the coaches come in and they're fully prepared. They got their systems. They got their, they got their ideas and philosophies. It really does come down to is this coach and what we have here currently something that can work with our group? Number one, and number two, is this a coach that the GM wants to work with? So, uh, I think that those are essentially uh, the, the the two key elements that come into it, right? And you know, again, like if you're if you're not if you don't understand what a coach can do, like you know, he's coming in, regardless, then you better back up. <laughs> mm -hmm. Totally fair. All right, Craig, let's wrap up with some rapid fire. I've got some questions for you. The only rule in rapid fire is that you need to answer them honestly. But first, I need to tell you about Manscaped. The new Lawnmower 4.0 is here. No more nicks and cuts on your twig and berries. The Lawnmower 4.0 has a wireless charging base, four different size shave settings, and even a built in LED flashlight to help you see better as you're shaving. As I've said, Craig, the Lawnmower 4.0 is really a gift for your wife or girlfriend when you think about it. We're here to help you keep trim and proper. Use promo code DFO21 for 20% off and free shipping. All right, so let's go with a little rapid fire here, Craig. After a long night of watching the Stanley Cup playoffs, what is Craig Button's drink of choice? Red wine. What, what, what kind have you been tasting recently? Oh, all kinds, Frank. I, I mean, I had a you Malbec. Discriminate. I, I had a Malbec on Saturday night at, uh, where I go to get my wine. Uh, Marcia. You have a wine guy, Craig? Well, I have a wine lady, Marcia. 
she's wonderful. And, uh, and where I go to get my wine and, and, and she knows my taste and everything. She, she told me to try this Malbec. And so uh, Saturday night had a wonderful Malbec last night. After the games ended, I had a little, I had, had a little nice, uh, a more full-bodied Pinot Noir. Uh, last week, I had some Sauvignon Blanc. I'm, I'm not, like, I'm going to have a glass of red wine, white wine, rosé. It's summertime, Frank. So, you know, I'm a, wow. uh, you, know, it, it, you know, my palate uh, doesn't predetermine anything. It just says, hey, what do I feel like tonight? Mm-hmm. I love it. When the pandemic in- ends... And the borders are open. Where is the Button family going on vacation? Uh, where are we going? That's a good question. Probably what I would say is, what I'd like to tell you is, is I'm going to a Springsteen concert whenever that started announced. announced. You know, that's that's something that we've done. I, I'm going to say that we are going to go to uh, uh, probably South Carolina where my sister-in-law lives my wife's sister and uh, her three kids and boys and my two girls are real close. And so I think that's, they got a nice pool in the backyard, you know, and I, I, South Carolina is open. <laughs> so that's where we'll be headed. That, that, that'll be the first, that'll be the first place we'll go. See, I, I thought, you know, I could just see you in a Hawaiian shirt. I thought you were going to say Hawaii. Yeah. Not at this time of the year. And we're, and we're, we're going to be there sooner rather than later. We're all, we're all uh, we're all second vax now. Love it. So, Craig, speaking of fashion, what is one article of clothing that you've worn that's gotten more comments than any other? My red sport coat. Uh, a couple of years ago, I bought it and I said I want something a little bit bolder. You know, Frank, you, you which know, says something coming from you and, and the stuff that you wear. <laughs> Well, you know me, I've said it all the time. My whole goal is to keep the focus completely off my face. And whether it's a, a, a tie that's properly knotted or a pocket square or, or a bright jacket, the more I can keep the focus off my face, the better off the viewer is. I, I knew you were going to say tie properly knotted. <laughs> Little known fact for anyone out there listening. Anytime I would come up to TSN to, to do, whether it was trade deadline or free agency, or we did a special on something and I'm on the air with Craig, I'd hand him my tie and have him tie it for me. And <laughs> he ties a better knot than anyone out there, but I, I, I still can't understand like exactly how he does it to get it perfect. He showed me, I don't know, a million times. <laughs> and I still like, I'm, every time it's like, it's like, you know, quantum physics for me. <laughs> well, do you remember the time? Was it Vancouver, the last draft? And we were upstairs getting ready to tape something. And you came over to me and you said, hey, I got it. And I think Owen was the uh, was the camera guy, right? So I got behind you and I'm tying the tie and people are like, what's going on here? It's, yeah, they're like, is this guy a toddler or what? He can't tie his own tie? Like, it's, and they're like, by the way, we're live in four minutes. Like, get it together. We got to go. <laughs> All right. So Craig, you've spent a lot of time around hall of famers. I want to ask you about, you know, two in particular, better storyteller, Bob Clark or Bob Gainey. Uh, Bob Gainey. Bob really? Gainey does, he does it in a dry way. And a lot of times you don't know where Bob's headed with a story. And then you, you really start to laugh. And I think that Bob Clark has these real, you know, significant growing up in Flin Flon, talking about mining and growing up in a mining, in a mining uh, community and his dad coming home, you know, you know, and, and everything that it meant for him to, you know, be hardworking. And, you know, I think it's more about real, real significant, you know, his life experiences and what he did. And Bob Clark has some great story, but Bob Gainey, I mean, like Bob Gainey is a, uh, is a, uh, is a, is a, is a, is, is a really good storyteller great dry sense of humor and and he's a vivant <laughs> mm. so keeping those two in mind knowing that you worked under both of them would you say w- which one is a better hockey mind bob clark or bob gainey who did you learn more from well you know i learned different things from both of them i i, I don't know if like i i don't know if i can say that there's one i i really can't honestly sit here and say one's better than the other bob clark we know what a great competitor he was. I learned so much from Bob Clark about like, we're here to compete. 
the, 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 this is about trying to be the best you can be in competition and, you know, and understanding how it wasn't just about being critical of players. If they weren't, it was about how do we help them get to another level? And you think about Bob Clark, isn't that what he did? Isn't that, you know, they talk about what a leader he was and how he encouraged people and how he, everybody wanted to play because Bob Clark was working as hard as anybody. Dave Poulin always tells stories. He goes, how lucky was he coming out of Notre Dame? And Dave was a hard worker, but to be able to have Bob Clark as his mentor. And I think that Bob really in, in those areas of, of, of raw, real competition, and he, he's always a thinker. I, I, think, I, I think both Ganey and Clark are, are great, innovative minds. You know, I've been in general managers meetings with them and heard them talk and people, you know, uh, would be would be absolutely thrilled to hear how open minded they are, how how they look at the game, and and they're not married to the past. They respect the past, but they're always looking at ways to to make the game better. I I, I think with Bob Ganey for me, and because I worked with him longer, you know, Bob was a was a real, and and, I'm, and again, just because I worked with him longer, he was an unbelievable developer of people. And, and I go back and, and he had a way, I used to say this about Bob Ganey. He, if he stepped on your toes, he did it with soft slippers. And I'll share a story. We went down to Dallas and, you know, it was a brand new community. It was people that, that, that didn't have a background in hockey. We're, we had about eight, nine people that worked in hockey. And Bob was coaching and you might recall it. It's, it's out there. But we had given out water bottles one night and uh, we gave them out before the game. And somehow the game got a little bit uh, uh, against us. And the fans thought that the referees were not worthy of, uh, of accolades. So they threw the water bottles on the ice. Is this game in Philly or Dallas? This was in Dallas. <laughs> no, this, this, no, honestly. It's such a Philly move, though. Like, that's yeah, what we would do. Yeah. But, you know, so two nights later, we, we were giving pucks away. Oh, like, no. you know, to, to the fans. Right. So Bob Ganey came into the, into the office. Right. And he's wearing a helmet. He was the coach at the time. He's wearing a helmet with a cage and he's walking around and he's walking around, uh, walking around the office and, you know, all like marketing sales, we were all tied into together. Right. And of course, you know, <laughs> Bob, you know, it's Bob and he, he's going to draw attention. Right. So finally somebody says, Bob, what's with the, uh, what's with the helmet and the face mask? He said, well, Tonight, I see we're giving away pucks. And he goes, uh, you know, the water balls, I wasn't too worried about getting in the head or the face with. He goes, I'm worried about the pucks. So I'm just practicing out wearing this uh, all day. So I'll be comfortable behind the bench tonight. And they said, do you think they'll throw the pucks? And somebody said, do you think they'll throw the pucks? He goes, not if we give them away after the game instead of before the game. And he had this great way of just pointing out that we need to do something differently. And, but he did it in a, in a, in a way that was, wasn't offensive fun. or oh, yeah. it was great. And Frank, I, 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 I know I've told you this, but when we won the Stanley cup in 1999 and you, you know, you're celebrating a lot of different things, but the people that were all in our locker room that night was everybody that was part of our organization, everybody sales, marketing broadcast, and nobody, there wasn't one person that looked around and said, this wasn't a group that everybody contributed in some way, shape, or form. And I, I, I give so much credit to Jim Lights and uh, and to Bob Ganey for creating that that environment. But Bob was Bob was so good in that way of, you know, really being able to and, and he under he he wanted to understand. He wanted to understand meetings and not not mean marketing. He wanted to understand sales and broadcasts and and building operations and not that Bob Clark didn't, I just wasn't around for, for, for any of that with Bob Clark, but I'll tell you what, Bob Clark, he, he, he instilled a, a sense of you have an obligation when you're in the national hockey league to, to, to be a competitor. You know, if you ever, we, we've talked about tanking in the NHL, don't get Bob Clark started on tanking. He, 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 he might give you a cross check against uh, across the face. If it, if it was a 22 year old Bob Clark. <laughs> Mm. So who's going to get that special experience this year to hoist the Stanley cup? Who's your cup pick? Uh, you know, I was a little bit concerned about Tampa Bay at the outset only because of, I didn't know where Kucherov was going to be. I didn't know where Stamkos and Hedman injury wise were going to be. I'm not, and it's hard against. to, it's hard I'm to fit that against. switch too. Yeah, yeah it, it, exactly. It is right. But uh, right now and Tampa Bay, like they're the team that can beat you anyway, they can beat you. 
you know, they can, they can shut you down and they fall behind in game four, four, two, and they go, oh, we got to push it to another level here. And Vasilevsky was not having a good game. And I, I think it's always interesting when it, we, we see the quality of goaltending and we, we know the goaltenders find a way to, 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 to get on, to help their team get on the right side of the score. Well, Tampa Bay found a way to get their goaltender on the right side of the score yesterday when he wasn't his best. And, you know, you get those moments where you just, you, they're so interconnected and, you know, I know they're the defending Stanley cup champions and, you know, it's hard to repeat, but watching what they've gone through with Florida and now watching what they're going through with Carolina, two quality teams, I think they're primed to, to, to compete for the Stanley cup once again, that would be my pick. And Frank, I, I said at the end of the year, I thought it would be Colorado. At the, after the first round of the playoffs, I said Colorado. We knew Vegas and Colorado were two really good Stanley Cup contending teams. The pendulum might have swung a little bit in uh, favor of Vegas right now. And it'll be interesting in that game five to see what Colorado can do. It will be interesting. Well said, Craig. And geez, really appreciate having you step in and, and fill the, the large shoes of Jason <laughs> Greger on the rundown here. Uh, always a pleasure having you and, and really appreciate it. I'm going to miss working alongside you so closely at TSN and I know where to find you next time I need a tie tied. Oh yeah. Well, I'm thinking Frank, I have a bunch of ties that I think I'm just going to tie and say, you just, you, just don't unknot them. See, I yeah. always tell, I always tell you, Frank, like when I knot them, just slip them down and flip them up over your head. Then they're readily not. But like the first thing you do is you take that tie off and you go, Oh, what have I done? Well, I'll see. I'll just put them in my closet. I'll set up a nice little rack, all pre-tied Craig ties. Maybe what I should do is, is make my first visit to the uh, Cerevali abode, right? And like, you'll put me to work for the first uh, little <laughs> first while. First half hour, yeah. ties. <laughs> And then we'll reward you with some red wine. Whatever, whatever. My, my, you know what I had the other night? I, I made a, I made a vodka drink. I like vodka too. Like, you know, I'm just, like, is this turning into something? But you know, I'm with a, with a mixer with rosemary and some lavender. And, uh, and anyway, I, I was a little bit nervous. It was, uh, we were having, uh, my daughter and her boyfriend and my youngest daughter, we were all having dinner. And, you know, my, my youngest daughter worked at a bar and was a bartender. So she can be quite uh, the critic. But at the end of it, they said, this was pretty good. So I kind of felt pretty good. So what was it? It was vodka with uh, like a, a, a mixer with rosemary and a little bit of St. Germain liqueur mm-hmm. and a little bit of Prosecco. With a, See, with that's a- right up Jason Greger's alley. He has Thirsty Thursday every week. His wife was also a bartender. They got a fantastic cocktail of the week. You should follow him on Instagram and check it out. I will. Good. I did not know that about Jason. Yep, thirsty uh, I, Thursday. Yep. Thursday. I will. I will jump on that and everything. Well, I hope Jason uh, has had a good time in the mountains, <sighs> and uh, you got a good partner there, Frank. And uh, uh, as you said at the beginning of the show, uh, you know, uh, there's different times in our lives where you know we don't get the same opportunity to to work as closely, but that doesn't mean we won't in the future. But one thing's forever: friendship. Totally agree, Craig. Thank you for that, and. I I still, you know, we were talking about ties and I'll, I'll leave everyone with this one time. uh, I had a tie that was like falling apart and I at, you know, he had, (laughs) Craig had been all over me to get rid of this tie. Like what, like, what is this? Throw this out. Like literally like I had it held together by duct tape, but it went so well with this one suit that I wore and I really liked it. And he looks at me, he goes, do you wear shitty underwear? And like, we're about to go on air. I'm like, what, the, what is, what's he talking about? Do I wear shitty underwear? I'm like, no, I don't wear shitty underwear. And he's like, well, then why do you wear a shitty tie? <laughs> like throw it out. And I'm like, okay, fine, fine. Fair enough. Fair enough. I get it. So I, I probably said it in that inflection too. Like, yeah. It was like, <laughs> throw it out. I'm like, okay, like, fine. You're, you're right. I don't wear shitty underwear. Why would I wear a shitty tie? So that the infinite wisdom of Craig Button. Thanks for listening to the DFO Rundown with Cervalli and Gregor. Keep it locked on dailyfaceoff.com and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts from to never miss an episode.